Hey everyone, in this video, we're gonna talk about porn. Well, actually, no, not really. This isn't a video about porn. This is a video about bringing people together, even when we have to stay apart, about getting the job done and what we do when we're done at our jobs, about innovation, and staying true to our roots. That's right, this is a video about the sexiest topic of all, big data and monopolistic web companies. Now, I'm just going to say this off the top, that while this video will be fairly critical of aspects of the porn industry, I'm just going to take it as a given that there's absolutely nothing wrong with making porn or doing any type of sex work in and of itself. This is a no-swerf zone, baby, so get out of here. For anyone who doesn't know, SWERF stands for Sex Work Exclusionary Radical Feminist. It's a play on the term TERF, which stands for bigotry. Also, there are some people who will say that TERF is a slur, which I find so funny because I always assumed that they picked that name, right? Like, trans exclusionary radical feminist is already so much nicer than what I would have named them. That'd be like if I told everyone to start calling me cool, smart guy who fucks, and then people started saying stuff like, yo, cool, smart guy who fucks is a sack of shit. And then I just started saying, calling me cool, smart guy who fucks is literally violence. Anyway, this is the last thing I'll say about this, but there's this really messed up thing I've noticed where people, often ones who would not consider themselves swerfs, will consume the products of sex work while simultaneously denigrating the people responsible for making them come. And like, not in the hot way. If you find that you are one of those people, I think you really need to do some soul searching, do some research, and reevaluate your views. Or else, at the very least, you should stop watching porn and simply go fuck yourself. There are lots of great videos specifically focused on debunking swerf talking points, some of which will be linked in the description, but that's not what I'm doing in this video. I put that debunking life behind me. One of the problems in porn is that it's very rarely taken seriously by people in power. And when it is, it's pretty much always just as like a freedom of speech issue. It's very rare to see it be addressed as a labor issue, as an artistic issue, or as a technology issue. And that's exactly what I hope to do in this video. I should also add the caveat that I'm not a sex worker, and while I did talk to a bunch while I was working on this video, I am an outsider who's coming in acting like I'm some kind of expert to talk about a group of people who are shit on by society. You know, standard straight white guy stuff. It's kind of our thing, it's what we do best, um, it honestly is part of our culture, and Frankly, anyone who tells us not to is basically a fascist. But as we'll see, non-sex workers talking about sex work tend to get things wrong a lot. I've been working pretty hard to minimize my fuck-ups here, but if this is your first time learning about any of the things I'm gonna cover, Please just consider this video to be at best a jumping off point for you to then go and learn more. I should also point out the fact that I'm uploading this video to probably the sketchiest tube site of all, YouTube. I'll be addressing this a bit more later, but for now, let's just not be under any illusions. Almost all of the bad things I'm going to talk about are just as bad, if not way worse, on YouTube. 
Anyway, I think that's all the disclaimers out of the way. The swarfs are all gone. Everyone's going to be cool. Now on to the fun part, starting with a brief history of porn on the internet. Get it? Because this is what it looked like when people had to download porn on dial-up. Porn has always been on the cutting edge of technology. VHS versus Betamax, Laserdisc versus DVD, HD DVD versus Blu-ray, porn picked the winner in all of those. The first online purchase with a credit card was to buy porn, and so, not surprisingly, sex workers were among the first posters on the early internet. One thing that I think is really cool is that in the early internet, Porn would be on these small sites that were usually completely run by the performers. As the internet moved from web wheels to search engines and sites became more complicated, fuck you, CSS, porn sites changed. One interesting thing here is that while niche and fetish porn had obviously existed before this, the rise of search engines meant that porn needed to be labeled with keywords, which is what led to the development of more distinct genres. As hard as it may be to imagine now, there was a time when if you wanted to see My Little Pony Fin Dom breath play, and to be honest, who doesn't, you had to track down a specific website that would be just that. But also, sites became bigger and harder to manage by individual people, and so you would get online companies. These gave rise to aggregator sites, which starting out were just hosting pirated content. These came to be known as tube sites since they were modeled after, and in some cases just straight up copy pasted the code from YouTube. Which, you know, points for consistency. I mean, if all the content is pirated, why would you expect them to write their own source code? One way that porn was actually behind the times was that the digital disruption of the 2000s took longer to hit porn than other types of media. While CD sales fell apart in the early 2000s, porn was actually able to hold on to the traditional mom and pop selling DVDs behind a beaded curtain distribution system until nearly the end of the decade. Inevitably though, around 2008, DVD sales crashed and tube sites took over. Now, when I say tube sites, there's actually only one company that really runs things. MindGeek is not only how Chris Angel addresses nerds, but also the name of the biggest streaming company that you've probably never heard of. MindGeek owns an ever-growing list of the biggest porn sites and production companies. At time of recording, MindGeek owns Pornhub, RedTube, YouPorn, TubeAid, Brazzers, XTube, SpankWire, ExtremeTube, Keys Movies, PornMD, Thumbzilla, Reality Kings, My Dirty Hobby, TransAngel, Sean Cody, Men.com, Digital Playground, Mofos, Babes, GayTube, Twisties, Peepers, SexTube, PornIQ, Webcams.com, BDSM.xxx, Casting.xxx, Chech.xxx, DameJones.com, FakeAgent.com, FakeTaxi.com, Lesbia.com, MassageRooms.com, Mature.xxx, Tubes.xxx, Orgasms.xxx, PublicAgent.com, PublicSex.xxx, Teen.xxx, and Mom.xxx. I mean, say what you will about them, you can't deny they're a family company. Now, I'm not going to call MindGeek a monopoly, but there are absolutely no other single companies that own as large a chunk of the industry as they do. And like, they do some monopolistic shit. Basically, MindGeek is a monopoly in the same way that I can grow a great mustache. Like, like there's some gaps in here, but you can tell what the end goal here is. MindGeek's inner workings are extremely opaque. If you go to their website, it looks like this and just says that they're a technology company. This is so weird to me because MindGeek is the porn industry. 
Nothing I've said here is in any way a secret. Why is their site like this? Did the owners just not tell their wives that they make porn and then hastily cobbled together this site as an alibi? As best as I can tell, MindGeek's business model is essentially as follows. When any of the many large production companies MindGeek owns shoots a video, first, a script is written by MindGeek's in-house team of writers, which basically consists of like a dozen burnt out comedians in Montreal. By the way, don't let the fact that most of MindGeek's staff and offices are in Montreal fool you into thinking that they're a Canadian company. They are a Luxembourgian, Luxembourg-ish? Luxembourgian? I think that's right, but it sounds wrong. Anyway, the point is that they're technically from Luxembourg because that lets them avoid paying taxes. The script is then sent to the director, who is subcontracted by the studio and is also, just like the rest of the cast and crew, non-union and paid a flat rate, no overtime, no residuals. Once made, the video is then posted, either to be streamed behind a paywall or sold as a clip. Either a shorter version of the video or just a full video that's old enough to no longer be lucrative will then be posted for free. The free content then is basically just used as advertising. Individual performers can then also, depending on the tube site, set up their own premium accounts such as Pornhub VIP. Pornhub will also actively funnel viewers towards the accounts of performers they watch, and also pays out a hell of a lot better than any comparable tube site, including YouTube. As for how MindGeek makes the money, well, they obviously make the money from all the premium content made by the production companies they own, and then there's just some good old-fashioned ads and copious amounts of data that they harvest from everyone who uses their sites. Surprisingly, it's actually pretty difficult to find out what MindGeek does with all the information they collect. Weird, huh? Real, uh, real Alanis Morissette moment, you know? Probably fine though, right? I mean, actually, they almost certainly just use it to curate what type of content you'll see on their sites, as well as to feed you targeted ads and or sell it to someone else who will feed you targeted ads. It's basically the exact same business model as probably all the sites that you spend your time on. Including this one. Although, while MindGeek is absolutely in no way unique for doing this, they are kind of unique, at least among streaming sites, just in how good they are at it. Once again, leading the way in technology, tube sites gather data on everything you do and everything you watch. These sites know things about your sexual preferences that you don't even know. MindGeek has data on what clothes you think are hottest, what positions turn you on, and even what furniture layouts make you nut the hardest. The other really weird thing that makes MindGeek, or at least their most public-facing site, Pornhub, unique is how they like to show off your, I'm sorry, their data. Pornhub runs a page called Pornhub Insights, where they post clickbaity articles about how people are looking up all sorts of epic and random stuff, like fidget spinner porn. Ugh. And like, I'm not saying that them posting that stuff is evil or anything. At least not any more evil than any of the other websites that use this exact same business model. But like, isn't it weird that it's just seen as like funny and cool when Pornhub publishes data on how much porn people have been watching since the start of the pandemic? If Facebook published the data on how often people creeped their ex's profiles since March, I don't think we would all just be cool with that, right? The other interesting thing here is that while Pornhub insights get lots of press, they're never independently verified. I mean, it makes sense that MindGeek is so protective of their raw data since that is one of their most valuable assets, but maybe we should be expecting news outlets to apply a bit more scrutiny rather than just uncritically reporting whatever Pornhub says. Like, who does MindGeek think they are? The police? And I'm not saying that the data is faked or anything, but Pornhub Insights is absolutely a PR campaign, so 
it might not be great that very often they're the only source that's used in a lot of pop psychology surrounding porn. The insights Pornhub publishes are manicured to be funny or happily report that people are more sexually liberated than ever. And I'm absolutely not saying that either of those are bad things, but you will never see any insights published about how many people watch the racist or transphobic videos that MindGeek hosts on all of their sites. But the big issue with MindGeek is their hosting of pirated content. Like I said, this is how tube sites started out. Imagine if Spotify started as Napster, but also still was Napster. And this is an important part of how they were able to take over the industry. Not saying that this is a conspiracy or anything, but when Manwin, the company that would later become MindGeek, was first negotiating with porn producers who might not have wanted to accept whatever offer they were making, Manwin could, since they still host pirated content, basically say to them, look, your stuff's gonna wind up on our site either way. If you take our deal, at least you'll make something off of it. Again, I'm not trying to put any conspiracy theories out. I don't believe that that was a literal conversation that anyone at Manwin or MindGeek ever had with anyone, but that dynamic is absolutely why MindGeek was able to dominate the industry. This of course isn't an issue anymore though, since MindGeek bought most of the major porn production companies. I'm just gonna take a big sip of coffee while I look up the definition of a vertical monopoly. It's actually really hard to find the definition of a vertical monopoly. Now, real quick, first of all, I definitely don't think that all piracy is necessarily bad, since I'm definitely not a fan of intellectual property being a thing that exists, but I'm even less a fan of artists not being compensated for the work that they do. Secondly, to be fair, MindGeek has made efforts to deal with piracy, and with the amount of videos that get uploaded daily, it is inevitable that some pirated stuff will get through. They've actually gone further than basically any other platform by developing their own fingerprinting technology that allows creators to, like, register their videos across all of MindGeek's sites. However, if you want to use that technology to proactively prevent people from uploading your videos to any of MindGeek's sites, you have to upload that video yourself, which is a problem for any of the people who just don't want their content on MindGeek, period. They do still take down videos for independent performers who aren't on the platform, but the onus is on the performer to find the video and report it, which involves them spending ridiculous amounts of time or likely hiring someone to comb through the web looking for pirated videos. Which is obviously not very doable for smaller performers who, you know, just don't want their OnlyFans content to wind up on Pornhub. And while experiences with this process differ from one performer to another, MindGeek has a real bad track record when it comes to removing revenge porn or videos containing illegal acts. This is especially ridiculous since Pornhub claims to manually review every image or video that gets posted to their site which is just the most ridiculously obvious lie I've ever heard. <laughs> like, in 2019, 19,000 videos were uploaded daily to Pornhub. This is all to say that MindGeek is not totally evil and obviously not totally good. Even with the very serious problems that they have, they have also done a lot to raise the standards of working conditions in the industry, and I don't want to take that away from them. Choo-choo! All aboard the Nuance Express. Next stop, fair and balanced critique. 
So something else that's worth talking about here is how porn gets studied and reported on. When I'm making these videos, I would say that one of the things I'm the most proud of in my work is the amount of research I do. Uh, pretty much all my videos are heavily researched through academic sources and some good journalism. I've definitely been doing some of that in this video too, but then I also started reaching out to people in the industry and quickly found out that a lot of what academics and journalists write about porn is straight up wrong. The reason being is that these people very rarely actually talk to real sex workers. And so you see some really bad takes in these articles that are supposed to be from official sources. For example, one thing I would see is in the few articles that actually talk about the labor conditions of porn performers, they would frame it as low wages from tube sites forcing performers to become escorts and that the solution was just for them to move over to OnlyFans. As one sex worker who asked to remain anonymous said, Rates in the adult industry have been stagnant since the 90s or so, which is related to tube sites, but also to production companies not raising wages with inflation. We also lack any kind of royalties like mainstream film actors, so we have to get by on just that one-time payment. Porn performers definitely have to diversify using things like camming or OnlyFans or escorting, which creates a sort of gig economy. While we're here, I would like to challenge the framing of forcing performers to turn to escort. Escorting is labor like any other and should be decriminalized. And I would never criticize someone for wanting to make in an hour with a client what they would otherwise make in a day on set. I don't think stagnant wages in porn force someone to be an escort any more than low wages at her Starbucks job might force a woman to become an escort. Capitalism forces everyone to make decisions about what kind of labor they do to survive. Escorting is often framed as the worst, most dangerous integrating labor, and I want to challenge that. It's emotional labor, it's body work, it's sex work, and a lot of what makes it bad is criminalization and the threat of state violence. So I guess one question would be like, what do you think people get wrong uh, when they're trying to study sex work or the porn industry particularly, or, or just more broadly? I mean, like, a, a, excluding just like straight up swerfs, like, what is it like when people are trying to come at yeah. it in good faith that they'll get wrong? Um, good faith is a good question, because most of the things that I see um, on sex work or pornography in general are not... Um, academic studies. I'm not saying that those aren't going on, but most of what I see is the things that people are interested in, which of course is the sensationalized stuff, whether it's, right. you know, the Netflix documentary, Hot Girls Wanted, that mm -hmm. most of us have seen, or other things like that, like any television show, reality television show, or expose on something, you know, salacious, they're going to try first to sell it. Mm -hmm. Because what is a documentary that just sits on the cutting room floor? It's absolutely nothing. So without salacious content, you don't have viewers. And so often to find that salacious content, you're going to, whether it's as a journalist or as a documentary maker, you're going to be drawn to those stories that are more, um, not just interesting, but fit, you know, that journalist's view already. So you're compiling information that's already you know, making the dialogue you have set out in your head real. And you can do that in both academics and journalists, but the, the benefit of having, you know, academics study us, which doesn't happen very often, is you hope that they have a greater sense of objectivity. You know what I mean? Mm. It, not that that's entirely true, but when you're basing most of your information on the sex workers, uh, especially, you know, with the, the things that we look at the most, which is television, you're getting a very skewed view. So I think that's a big part of the problem, the social stigma, what people across the world have decided about us definitely drives what they're interested in, driving sales and then driving the content itself. Right. I mean, do you think that there's anything that people could do who are trying to make like a, a good faith effort? Like what, is there any like guiding principles or like best practices that you would want to see more of? 
That's a tough one. Um, just some small little things that I often find, um, I don't know if the word is annoying or inaccurate. I find a lot of the, especially television type documentaries, they, and I'm not sure why they do this, if it's accessibility or it's lack of knowledge, but they go after people or they've, they've interviewed people who in most cases are, there's no, there's only one harsh way to say this, I guess, irrelevant. You know, it, it would be like saying, I am going to do an expose on American basketball and never interviewing anyone who is ever relevant in the sport. Like, like if you're asking Kobe, he'd be like, who? Like, those aren't the people you want to interview. I mean, you want to interview people who are really playing the sport, who have made a career out of playing the sport, who are playing the sport at the highest level, and who have the actual information that you're trying to get. I don't know if those people in porn aren't accessible to a lot of the journalists, or if they don't have the story that the journalist was looking for, but it seems they're, excuse me, often going for um, very, uh, you know, like, because porn is huge, right? right How right. do you become a pornographer? Like, you could, right now, jerk off under the table and sell it on Pornhub. Boom, you're a pornographer. <laughs> but that doesn't mean the people who are doing this, grinding it out day in, day out, would know who you are. Right. So are you relevant? Of course, you have an opinion, but I, I wish that more people who other performers who are just doing it as a career would at least know the name of you know, right. that would be that would be my wish that they would go after people who are really living the and doing the work they're trying to get information out of. Um, I th the, the biggest mistake, obviously, I, I is people going to people who aren't sex workers about sex worker shit, because you can find all types of fucking dumb shit articles all over the Internet about like just just untrue things like com just complete like false uh narratives that people create just because they they think sex work is an easy target or porn's an easy target um so you know i i would like i would say to anyone who wants to do anything like this is do exactly what you're doing <laughs> and you know talk to talk to actual like working performers and like working sex workers um you know to 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 see the state of the industry of the sex industry in general. That's, that's how you, that's how you get your info. Usually it's a lack of when people are uneducated on things, they rely on stereotypes. So a lot of stereotypes that have been provide, provided by the media and Hollywood and stuff like that are not very empowering about sex workers. And until you actually speak to sex workers, start reading books that were written by sex workers, I think you don't really understand the nuances that go on and the fact that there is a huge difference between someone consensually doing sex work and someone being coerced to in, into doing it in any form, including financial coercion, which is like the biggest mm -hmm. problem that I have with it, is that in the capitalist society that we live in, people are financially coerced into doing things that they normally wouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that. <laughs> that is when people are put in situations I think that harms harms their soul, their happiness. Yeah. It doesn't lead them to living wholehearted, fulfilling lives when they are in a sexual situation and they are saying, I would never do this if it wasn't for the money. More generally though, the issue with a lot of articles that talk specifically about mind geek is that they tend to frame things in these very black and white terms. Whereas in reality, things are a bit more gray. Let me give you a bit of an analogy. For a long time, I lived and worked in a neighborhood of Toronto called Kensington Market. For anyone who's never been, this picture should tell you everything you need to know about it. Kensington Market basically looks like if a 20th century European fishmonger and a tie-dyed shirt fell in love and formed a small nation state together. It's a place where crust punks, rastas, and artsy hipster trash like me all live in harmony. Kensington Market is also in the process of being brutally gentrified. 
there's kind of this constant struggle going on with Kensington where, you know, Starbucks or whatever will try and open a store there and everyone will sign petitions and the community will get organized and we'll stop them for now. But I remember when I was working there, I would always think how, you know, I certainly do not want Kensington Market to turn into a bunch of condos and Rexalls like everything else in Toronto, but also, if I was working at Starbucks, I'd get a raise, and dental, and maybe the accountant who keeps sexually harassing female staff members might get fired. MindGeek is the Starbucks of porn here. You know, there's lots and lots and lots to criticize them for, but also I feel like it'd be a bit dishonest if I didn't bring up the fact that most of the performers I talk to would much rather be on a MindGeek set than anywhere else. In the, like, all the research I've done, especially if you're looking at, like, the academic and the journalistic stuff, a narrative very quickly emerges, um, that uh, portrays MindGeek as this extremely evil, monolithic uh, monopoly. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, like, my question would be, uh, is MindGeek evil? <laughs> uh, evil? No, I don't think a business entity, at least, you know, Americans, we value capitalism, right? Mm. And I think a lot of industries, for better or worse, I think a lot of people could argue on both ways, have become a monopolies, whether it's Amazon or your local cable company or a lot of other things. So I think a lot of people would say that, you know, monopolies might be bad for creativity, monopolies might be bad for independent business owners, you know, and they're not a, a genuine monopoly like a lot of other industries, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, as, as far as the question is, is MindGeek evil? You know, I don't, I don't really think that, you know, you have a situation where like, you know, companies are, are, are good or evil. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that they've, you know, made some, some poor choices and choices that really didn't consider um, the impact on the adult industry, uh, the impact on production companies, impact on performers. And I do see them trying to kind of like make up for that in some ways. I think mm -hmm. there are um, some very easy things that they can implement to um, protect studios, performers, and just individuals, um, especially when it comes to kind of like revenge porn, um, you mm -hmm. know, making sure that, you know, people who upload stuff are, are verified. Yeah. Um, so that like, you know, when, you know, actions need to be taken, they can be taken. I, I think a lot of the issue is that so much stuff that happens on Pornhub is done anonymously. Mm -hmm. So it becomes really, really hard to correct things like when they go wrong and when they um, hurt people. Um, you know, and I do think that they have definitely, you know, put forth this trend that um, porn should be free. Um, and I firmly believe that you should absolutely pay for your porn um, and try to buy it, you know, directly from um, the source as possible from those performers who are making that content. Um, whenever you can. <laughs> I mean, I think if you are smart and you realize that you yourself are a brand, you can utilize the MindGeek websites and tube sites to build your brand and get your message out there for whatever it is, because a lot of people are on there. You can utilize it however you want. But I think that OnlyFans has changed the landscape. I don't think we need these giant porn production companies to like mm -hmm. become big stars anymore. And it's, uh, it's all up to us. It's all up to us to be a responsible, like, individual and save up our shit because we definitely don't have any 401ks. You know, originally our stuff was completely stolen. Mm -hmm. And then some of the more ethical tube sites were like, ah, this is fucked up. We're going to play ball with the artists. And some of them are still like, fuck you. Mm -hmm. We're going to do anything we want and happily steal all your stuff. So yeah, I'm just glad that at least some of them are like, you know what? We're done fucked up. We're going to give you some of this money. And some of them are like, eh, stealing your stuff still. In a lot of ways, MindGeek has been leading the charge in legitimizing and improving conditions in the porn industry through things like the fingerprint technology I mentioned earlier, better pay, a higher standard of quality on set, 
and even things like consent checklists that allow performers to check off what they are and aren't comfortable doing. Not to mention their work to legitimize porn and sex work as a whole through things like the Porn Awards and their big PR campaigns. Which we'll come back to, but it is important to recognize that legitimizing sex work is a very good thing. One of the things that a lot of journalists have talked about is how performers are afraid to come out and criticize MindGeek for fear that they'll be shadow banned or punished by the algorithm. And while there absolutely have been several people I've talked to who have remained off the record for fear that criticizing MindGeek would hurt their careers, there have also been performers who I've talked to who don't want to criticize them because they like MindGeek. MindGeek is a pillar of the industry in a small business. Sex workers are a marginalized group, and the porn industry is like a little family. We tend to look out for our own, especially with so many misconceptions running rampant. I find that porn performers tend to tell our stories as ones of empowerment, since so many people prefer to paint us as victims. The reality of porn, and of MindGeek, falls somewhere in between good or bad. We defend them and point out the good in porn because we know there will always be outsiders eager to point out the bad, often in an attempt to undermine us and our rights. MindGeek is an easy and, to be fair, very justified monopoly to go after, but I think that also when people cover them, they do so in a way that lets other things slide. There are some way worse players in the industry, like Dogfart or Blacked, who regularly put out incredibly racist videos. Although it is pretty easy to look good if you're being compared to companies like that. It'd be like, I don't know, imagine if Canada just laughed off a bunch of human rights abuses because we're next door neighbors to a country that did a lot of way worse shit. With that said, while MindGeek may not make those types of videos, they certainly don't have any problem making money by hosting them on their sites. Likewise, while they may not mistreat their workers, they don't have a huge problem with those who do, since they keep giving awards to Axel Braun, a director who's notorious for abusing his cast and crew. Because porn and sex work are so stigmatized, a lot of the industry has been able to develop without much critical oversight, or at least not the good kinds of critical oversight. The porn industry is basically exactly how the film industry would have turned out if SAG-AFTRA had never existed. I haven't even had time to go into the treatment of crews on porn sets. But because of this lack of attention, MindGeek has been able to craft its own narrative and position itself as this woke ethical vanguard. And while I don't want to take anything away from the good things that have been accomplished by people who work at MindGeek, I'm not holding my breath for them to tackle issues like how wages have remained stagnant in porn for the past 30 years or them implementing a much-needed policy that would prevent non-verified users from uploading content, something which would massively curb the amount of pirated videos as well as revenge porn and illegal acts, things which also make MindGeek money. And this is all obviously because we're talking about a massively profitable multinational corporation whose good deeds will never extend to the point of actually hurting their bottom line. Ultimately, porn corporate wokeness, while much sexier than regular corporate wokeness, choke me girl boss, it's ultimately never going to enact real reforms. I think this is a real problem moving forward. As sex work becomes more normalized, the people at the front of that movement should not be your friendly neighborhood secretive multinational conglomerate any more than they should be out of touch academics or journalists. Nor for that matter should they be really cool and smart YouTubers with a confusing occult aesthetic. The people we need to be hearing from are actual sex workers. The stagnation of rates in the adult industry and our lack of royalties are big concerns. It would be great if we had some organized way to get healthcare, 
people never talk about issues facing crew who are also non-union and lack labor protections. The public also focuses on female performers as victims, so they neglect the needs of male performers who can also be in coercive situations, especially because they have fewer supplemental income opportunities than we do. I'd love to see more conversation about including diverse voices in writing and direction, since we live in a deeply white, cis male dominated sphere. Now, this wouldn't be a we're in hell video if I didn't end pessimistically. I think there's a lot of misplaced optimism right now in the porn industry being disrupted by sites like OnlyFans. And look, I'm never gonna be upset about sex workers securing the bag. I just don't think that bag is as secure as people might think. I've seen a lot of like glowing accounts about how OnlyFans gives sex workers all this freedom and control and allows them to be their own boss and set their own schedule and it all just sounds exactly like how people talked about Uber in 2012. In fact, it's actually so much worse than that since making porn is actually a violation of OnlyFans terms of services. The precarity of OnlyFans was made very clear in September of the endless, timeless haze that is 2020. Actress Bella Thorne joined OnlyFans as what some would accurately call a PR stunt and or cash grab. She cleared a million dollars in subscriptions in one day and then started selling what she claimed was a nude photo for $200. This allegedly became the most purchased picture on the site and was also a scam. And so when all the furious fans of Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore movie Blended realized that they weren't actually going to get to see naked pictures of Hillary, they demanded refunds. I'm gonna be honest, I don't know anything about Bella Thorne, but I assume everyone who joined her OnlyFans was just a massive blended head. OnlyFans responded to this blended backlash by changing their payment policies to limit the amount that creators could make and also changing their payment period from once a week to once a month. Thousands of sex workers' incomes were put in jeopardy overnight. And this is just a small taste of what could happen if, say, OnlyFans decide they really wanted to be on the App Store and so they started enforcing their TOS to comply with Apple's ban on explicit content. This is all to say that none of these platforms can ever be trusted to look out for the interests of creators or workers. Also, if you like this video, please like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, maybe become a patron or just share the video. My last video didn't do very well and I do not want to go back to delivering for Uber Eats. Anyway, to step back and talk about things a bit more broadly, very little of what I've talked about in this video is unique to sex work. The transformation of the porn industry has, as usual, reflected the direction our world is going in, which happens to be stagnation and precarity. But if I can end this video on a bit of a happier note, which is very off-brand for me, if porn does predict the direction that our world is going in, then maybe we can get a bit of hope from the fact that the sex workers I talk to aren't resigning themselves to the neoliberal gig economy hellscape. So maybe we simps shouldn't either. Hey, please do not click off the video yet. I look at my analytics, I know that everyone turns off the video as soon as the credits roll. Just wanna say really quickly that uh, if you took anything away from this video, please, you can make a bit of a difference by uh, buying your porn. I know a lot of my viewers, as well as me personally, will be fairly skeptical of the idea of individual consumption habits having a massive impact with the absence of systemic change. However, buying your porn can very much mean the difference between a sex worker being able to afford their rent or not. 
So, please, please, if you took nothing else away from that, consider supporting your local sex worker. And where better a place to start than all the wonderful people who were featured in this video? Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure what YouTube is gonna let me put in my description, but I'll link them somehow, probably their Twitter or something. But yeah, please, please go and uh, support all the fine people who you heard from in this video. I know that the holiday season is a difficult time financially for a lot of people, but I can absolutely say that all of these sex workers would absolutely appreciate it, not just because these times that we find ourselves in are trying in general, but also because we're just coming out of No Nut November, and I'm sure that their incomes were absolutely devastated by that. So, you can really help them out there. Anyways, this video would not be possible without the help of my wonderful patrons, so big thank you to all of them, especially Christopher Tubbs, Comrade Fox, Royal Road, Macubus Goobus, Jacqueline Collins, Rachel Ann, Niels Abelgard, Buzzkiller, O Death, Dr. Thembo69, Thighs and French Fries, Daniel Jocelyn, Swithers, J. Fraser Cartwright, Mosh Zombie, Ramsey Bargudi, Megan Glynn, Caleb F. Fails, William Rowe, Alec J. Radecki, Julia Soares, the fucking motorcycle that's going by my window right now, Cameron Hussein, Just Oh No, Evan, Cody Stevens, Tony Wise, Sean McIntyre, Max Gorenson, Alfonso, Jacob Friedman, Graydon Sims, G. Purr, Casey Kutniak, Jubion, Nick Corpius, Ruby, Jamie, oh no, Baron Golgrita Af Crystal Krona, <laughs> nail it every time, Kenzie G, Clement Chutskoff, Toby Robbins, Arnez Calling, Kells, Trenton Coleman, Heather Boning, Phil Argeria, Rob Rorary, Max Alfond, Becca B, Tom Bancroft Rimmer, Shilo Sojourner Sachs, Thomas Brereton, Maddie G, Sith, Vegito, Maurice Robert, Anis23, Gamb, Morgan, Relaxo, Tim Hoffsummer, Nemo, Good Poon Hates Cops, that's Solid Poon then, Comrade Sai, Isso Kuhn, Eric Pedden, Russell Gilchrist, Dylan Robinson, Tim Rockwell, Benick G. Spicer, The Silver Samaritan, Grant Kalowski, Simon, Thomas Swords, Alexandra Falls, Kristen, Subsystem of Society, Communist Android, Christina Davies, QTA10, Ron Doofdad, Jack Crawford, Judd from Splatoon, Lonely Party, Alex Arcudi, Eggsbox, Kennedy, Loween, Christina Ball Hewis, Muppet Mistake, Kashalti, and John Price. Thanks so much for watching. Have a have a, a, hot, a happy holidays. <laughs> I don't know how to end videos.